I was working my whole life to get something and when you have this such a strong mindset of what you want and you will be beyond relentless to get it nothing matters when you're in this boxing game you really get one crack i was very fortunate that i was able to not just become a world champion but to unify the division so uh, it was an incredible achievement the irish known for their heart and their fighting ability this week's guest is a guy called ryan burnett former world champion between the years of 2017 and 2018. He also had a very successful amateur career. 94 wins and only four losses. Ryan Burnett shares with me his career, the ups and downs and almost being homeless. He also shares with me the difference between training under Ricky Hatton and then Adam Booth. I believe you're gonna find this very interesting and insightful. Be happy, never content. Okay, welcome back to my podcast, Stephen Sully Study. Um, as everybody knows, I like to study very successful individuals, whether they're athletes, go-getters, entrepreneurs. The next man in front of me um, ticks pretty much all those boxes. Um, used to be former world champion, uh, two-time world champion, the ch uh, champ champ. Now is a business person. Now is a father, and I've just said to him off air, you think boxing's hard, wait until you <laughs> get in the rounds of, of, of this parenthood. But anyway, all jokes aside, Ryan Burnett, thank you for your time, and uh, thank you for coming on to the podcast. Cheers, thanks for having me on. No problem. So I listened to, I've actually had a guest on my podcast called Trish Dick Dixon, who you know very well, yeah. and I listened to your podcast with him, which is uh, Boxing Life Stories. Yeah. And... Um, I've, I've sort of subtly followed your journey for some time because my my boxing coach is jo Charlie B. I actually trained down boxing booth. And, what a guy. Um, Charlie, what a guy. He's a great guy, man. He's a great guy. The, the thing with Charlie, I've seen him develop because I think, how how many years ago was it when you started training with, with Charlie and boxing um, with Adam Booth? Must have been about seven years ago. I think I was with Adam for about probably around about seven years ago and then Charlie came onto the scene um, about four years ago. So I had about two years or so working with Charlie. Okay. Well, Charlie now is uh, his brand, the London Fire Brigade Boxing, is a sponsor to my podcast. Yeah. And um, his, uh, I mean, the evolution of his kind of career from when he had like to lift, doing personal training, obviously still a fire person, but now becoming a, professional boxing coach and taking Shannon Courtney to become a world champion and yeah. training the likes of yourself, Josh Kelly, um, Harlem Eubank. Uh, there's, there's a bunch of other people down that gym. I mean, it's incredible. I, I find it very, very inspiring to see that. Definitely. Um, Definitely. But with Trish Dixon, I, I really enjoyed that, that, that podcast, but my podcast isn't really, yeah, we're going to talk about boxing, obviously, because I've got a huge passion for boxing. And I think there's a, a crossover between the mindset of a boxer to a mindset of a business person, which you could probably vouch for that. But I want to talk about, you know, like lessons that the younger demographic can take away from an athlete, which is overcoming adversity, working extremely hard, hard work, dedication, um, you know, um, you know, you know, really putting the work in outside of your craft as well. So I, I know you're someone that, you know, has done all those things in, in your lifetime. So where should we start? Um, I think, I think, your achievements in becoming a world champion. Um, I mean, it must must have felt like a dream come true when you first won your your, your, your world title run. Um, yeah, it was definitely a dream come true. I think for every every boxer who's who's turned professional, your dream is to become a world champion. And I was very fortunate that I was able to reach the the highest, not just become a world champion champion, but to unify the division. So uh, it was an incredible achievement. It's definitely a dream come true. Yeah. Um, please take this the wrong way, but uh, and I know you've mentioned it on other podcasts and uh, reading up on, on your story and also your background. I think you mentioned it in different publications, but as far as a professional boxer is concerned, I know you had a few serious kind of injuries um, and looking at your resume, it's like 20 fights because now when you look at the likes of Canelo, Pac uh, uh, Pacquiao, uh, Floyd Mayweather, etc. They're going to 50 fights. They're going beyond 50 fights. So when you see a resume of just 20 fights, do you sometimes like look back and think, okay, I couldn't really do anything about it because of the, the injuries, but I kind of wish I was still in there and doing my thing? Um, 
Yeah, obviously you wish that you were still capable of fighting at that level. But I mean, if if I was in the mindset of I wish I was still there, I would always be down in the press. So when my career career ended the way it, the way it did, I sort of looked at what I did achieve and I was very grateful for what I had, not what I could have had. And having that mindset, and it didn't come straight away, I took a while to start thinking like that. When I start recognizing, well, look what you did do. Look the kind of life you've set up for yourself. And I just focused on that. That helped me get over the fact of, well, you're not a boxer anymore. You're not going to get in for those big nights anymore. Yeah. Um, I think that's a really good lesson there because as I mentioned to you in my voice notes, uh, Ryan, which I pestered you with uh, for, for many, many months. Um, the, um, this has been like six months in the making. I've <laughs> been really not has. busy, but six months in the making and finally here. Well, there's a lesson there, isn't there? Because I think if you can persist in a professional way, you can ultimately reach your goal. Your goal Absolutely. was to become world champion. My goal was to get you onto my podcast. Yeah. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, I think there's a great lesson there with what you said, because um, look, there's, there's lots of younger people, hopefully are going to be listening to conversations like this. And, um, you know, a lot of people, especially with the, 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 the era of social media, they're going to be looking at friends or people that they think they know and thinking that, oh, I'm not living the life that they've got. And they kind of fall into like mental health problems or depression or anxiety. The reality is you need to look at what you have achieved over over your lifetime and be grateful and thankful what you have, have achieved. And how important is that, do you think, being an athlete but now turned into a business person? But I appreciate in the past and where yeah. you have... Well, I mean, I think it's massive for keeping your head right and keeping your focus on moving the correct way because it's so easy to veer off and start thinking about it could have been like this or why don't I have that or something. It's very easy to start your your brain to be thinking that way. So for me, it really was, like I said, when my career came to the stop that it did, it was very important for me to say to myself, well, it's not what I could have had. It's well, what do I have? And what I have was 10 times better than anything I could ever imagine. So I just always focused on, what I've got and not where I could have been because yeah. it's, it was completely out of my control. So, um, yeah, I think having that mindset was very, very important to me anyway, to enable me to get back on the, a career of some sort and keep my life moving forward. Because when boxers retire, it's very, they sort of have this pattern where they'll go off the rails, they'll drink, they'll take drugs, they'll, just spiral out of control and I was definitely one of them I was I, I was on my way to nowhere and um, until I sort of said to myself you've worked your entire life to get what you have at the moment and you're just gonna throw it away and there was no way that that was gonna happen so I had to start focusing on well, what I have and what did I achieve and I'm grateful for that and how do I now push my life forward and it wasn't through drinking and being a Head I mean, um, just on that note, uh, Ryan, and um, part of me being a podcast star is to ask good questions, hopefully good questions, but also questions that I wouldn't typically ask if I met someone for the first time, but they're, they're perceived as hard questions for me anyway. And uh, look, boxers and any athlete, I mean, I've interviewed a lot of uh, football players for the likes of Anton Ferdinand, Kieran Richardson, who play for Man United and Lo- loads of different people and you're exactly right a lot of them if they don't have the next plan the next chapter in their life you can even without out you realizing veer off into the wrong type of lifestyle drink drugs mental health problems depression anxiety sometimes other type of abuse it, it can be quite a challenging time for these people um was there any kind of that in your life where you actually end up on drink or drugs or anything like that yeah, I mean, I've never taken a drug, but I was drinking very heavily uh, when I retired. Uh, I just, I was, my whole life since I was nine years old has been boxing. I didn't do well in school. I didn't have a backup plan. I had absolutely nothing. And when I was, when I retired in the fashion that I did, 
I was just sitting in the house and I was like, well, what do I do? I, I, I have no idea. And it's easy to get your nights in when you have a, a drink and you can sort of keep living the life, a lifestyle because you have this pot of money that you've created over a career. And I was just able to, ah, I'll do it next week and I'll just enjoy this, but I've never been off properly. Just do whatever I want. And that sort of spiraled into a good few months until my wife sort of grabbed me by the ear and said, you may get a hold of this. So, and then that's when I decided like you have to start thinking the correct way. You have to start putting your life in the right direction again. Otherwise you will end up back to where we were with nothing. And I was very, very determined that I would never be in a position. I was, very, I was homeless. And I was very determined that I would never be homeless again. And on the route that I was on, I, that's where I was heading. How, how come you were homeless? Because when I hear that, I mean, I see your well, you know, your, your belts in the background. You got a lovely home. Got obviously your brand new addition to your family. You look like you're in great nick now. You, you, you're upbeat. But when you say Ryan Burnett was homeless, that kind of doesn't even register with me. Um. Well, I was I moved to England on my own when I was 19. Uh, I just, the, there was more opportunity in England. So when I decided to go pro, I moved to England and everything was going well. I, I, I linked up with Ricky Hatton and I had four fights with him. But over the course of, I think it was two or three years maybe, uh, just things weren't correct. And I decided to leave Rick. But I wasn't thinking too far ahead. So when I left Rick, I then wasn't getting any money. Because I wasn't getting any money, I couldn't pay my rent. And when I couldn't pay my rent, I had to get out. So I slept in a car for a little while until I got my until I was able to get my shit together. Wow. Wow. Where where and if you don't mind me asking, where the hell was where where the hell was the car? Where where was you staying? In what part of the country? I was all over the place because my dad had come over and both of us like there was no money about us like so we couldn't exactly go and link up in a hotel or anything so we're sort of just driving about trying to get meetings and just trying to talk to other boxing coaches and it was just a long time of trying and trying and trying and we um i remember sitting in the back of the car and just being like all cor- cardboard boxes being like this this doesn't matter. I'll get to where I need to be. This is just a little blip. I'll, it'll be fine. And rightly so, we just kept trying and kept trying until eventually linked up with Adam. And then Adam, being the man that he is, changed my life immediately. So he did. Yeah, he's, a, he's an incredible coach. Now, in hindsight, when I have watched your fights and when I look at the likes of Josh Kelly, Harlem Eubank, even Mick now, Conlon, who's down now, who's fighting for a world title very, very soon. You can, and even when I went down to the old Haymaker, this is many years ago, because I used to be a sponsor for Bradley Skeet okay. and, and Sam Webb. And they went down to the old Haymaker and they sparred George Groves. And I remember watching George Groves and... I can I can almost see like the kind of link to everybody's style slightly. You all got your own version of that style, but you can kind of see the sort of the dip, the whip, you know, and all that. You know, it, you can just kind of see the influence that Mr. Adam Booth is giving you guys. But again, when you say stuff like like Ryan Burnett was with Ricky Hatton, I know again this is hindsight, but it's it doesn't almost seem like it would fit because yeah. it's a, like a different style. So. Why did you decide to work or train under Ricky Hatton initially? Was it because he was a great world champion or is it someone that he looked up to? What, why him? Yeah, he was a he obviously knew the game. Um back then he was he was a right fit for me, he had a great family life. He he had his own gym, everything seemed to fit. Uh and when I linked up with him, I loved training with him, it was great. I felt like I was learning uh, quite a bit. And that was that was that was the reason why we decided to to go with him initially. Okay, and then and then the so I know you said in a polite way that things weren't working out. Is there anything that you could share, or what was an, what what was the synergy like towards the end of it? Um, I just the long and short of it was I felt 
when you're in this boxing game, you really get one crack. That's it. And if it's not 100% correct, then things have to be changed. It has to be 100%. It can't be 99.9% correct. It has to be 100 And I just felt like it wasn't 100% correct for me, not for everyone else or people it might have been. But for me personally, it just wasn't. It was, it was something missing. And that's just, and I had a conversation with Rick about this and he agreed with me and he was, Rick, Ricky Hatton is one of the nicest guys I've met. He did so much. He went way, way, way beyond to help me. Um, but I had a conversation with Rick and Rick agreed and we parted ways uh, really correctly. Like there was no animosity yeah, or there was no badness. Yeah. yeah. Like I still talk to Ricky. So do. And that was probably nine years ago that I was with Rick. So like we still have a friendship, we still talk. Um, and he's, Ricky Hatton truly is a, he's a class guy. Like, mm. He definitely well caught class fighter as well. I really enjoyed some of his uh, formidable matches that he had. So then tell me about, you know, with, with, with Adam Booth then, because like I said, looking back, it, it was almost like you were made for each other. Um, why did you choose him? And when I listened to the Tris Dixon uh, podcast, he, it was almost like, not saying that you or anybody else has ever been, what's the word I'm looking for? Like intimidated, but it seems like you kind of really have to work your way to get into his kind of circuit or circle. And then both you kind of need to warrant and be eligible to be training with him. Um, yeah. what, what, you know, is that how, how, how true is that or how much, how much do you need to impress someone like him in order to be working alongside of him? Well, see with Adam, Adam's been in the game such a long time and he's, if, if everyone wants to work with him because he's so knowledgeable, he's, he's right up there, one of the best coaches on the planet. And I was trying to contact Adam for ages, but just getting nowhere. Probably I was on a long list of people that was trying to contact Adam and trying to get trained with him. But one thing that I had that no one else had was a contact close. So I know Andy Lee and me and Andy Lee was friends from the amateur game. I always followed Andy. Me and Andy had a bit of a friendship. So, and at the time, Adam was training with Andy. He was his coach. So I contacted Andy and was like, is there any way you could get me a session with Adam? And like, I'm looking to get new trainers and all and, and he put a good word in for me and says, look, there's this kid, give him a go, give a try and see what it is. So that was me. I got in the door and I can remember my first training session with Adam and I give it my all. And he come, he, he, after the pod session, he went into his office and come out and gave me a boxing booth t-shirt. I thought to myself, I'm in, I got this. And I phoned my dad and was like, here, I, he, he likes me, and rightly so. Uh, we signed a, a training contract, I think it was, and that was it. The rest is history. What was the kind of attributes, mindset, work ethic that he might have given you or, or influenced on you opposed to like other trainers that you had back in the day? Um, what, Adam, he, he gave me an understanding. It wasn't so much... It was more of an understanding of what to do. Like some coaches can say, yeah, one, two, hook and step this and do that. But when Adam did it, he says he, he broke everything down and give you a deep understanding of why you would do that, when you would do that, what's the mental pressure that you would feel when you're trying to do that. And he explained mental pressure. He, he would explain a movement and he would just very vividly break everything down. So when you're in those high intense situations his breakdown of something you knew you you had this feeling you knew what it was going to feel like because he had the knowledge of how to break something down i think that is what is really good about about adam and and from an outsider's point of view from a fan's point of view when i'm watching you and when he used to um, be in the corner for david hay etc there are times in a boxing match when it's not going your way, right? You know, you, yeah. you, 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 you're being attacked and at times you might feel a bit overwhelmed and there's a game plan which you need to stick to. How Adam appears in the corner is so 
calm. Like he's the calmest, most methodical guy that I've ever listened to when he's talking yeah. to their fighter. And it's incredible because he puts, for me, again, listening as an outsider, it seems like he puts everybody in a trance. Like, right, this is what you need to do. And I think that's a real, real skill for a trainer to have that, that really calm edge about them. Oh, he definitely has that. Like, if the fight with me and Zach Yanoff, um, I think Zach Yanoff was beating me the first three rounds. Like, beat me up, bullying me. And the plan with Zach Yanoff was sort of really stay on the back foot and box him. But I remember the first round, he punched me about the ring. Second round, punched me about the ring. Third round, punched me about. And I went back to the, after the third round, I went back to the corner. And Adam just really calmly just, let me breathe for 15 seconds, didn't say anything. And I've just been beat up for three rounds. And he just says, you need to go and fight with him. You need to have a fight with him. And it was just, everything's just so calm. It's not like he doesn't yell things at you. He doesn't, he just, and that's, he had given me an understanding. So during that training camp, we knew that that's, this might be the possibility. And during sparring and stuff, I remember very, very clearly that there'd be times in the sparring, he would say, stop the spar, Brian you got to fight with him. And I would, I would do it. And I knew I had these emotions and knew what it was like to be sparring people who are heavier than you, hit harder than you and hurting you. So when I went back to that corner and he says, like, you just got to, you got to fight with him now. Because what, what we were doing wasn't working. Then you see in the fourth round, I come out and I start taking control of the fight. But his whole process is very calm and collective because if he's panicking, then fighters going to panic. And and it seems seems to be he knows how to trigger different fighters with different kind of language. Uh, he's always very very calm, but he basically knows how to get the best of that out that particular fighter. And Sir Alex Ferguson, when I interviewed Kieran Richardson, who used to play for Man United and won the Champions League, etc., I said, "What was that like to be managed and mentored and coached by Sir Alex Ferguson?" He said exactly the same point. He said he would know calmly how to get the best out of these players. But every so often, he would turn up the heat on a certain individual because they responded better that way. Do you know on that note, when you were, you know, so you were fighting for the, you were unifying, you know, your world titles. Is that right? And yeah, yeah. You, had, you had Ricky Hatton in the opposing corner and he obviously had Adam Booth. Um, I know this is business, but at the end of the day, you're still human, Ryan, even though you've, you've achieved, you know, beyond human achievements, you're still human at the end of the day. So there's going to be, there's going to be, I don't know, loads of different emotions probably flying around in your body. What, what was that feeling like where you used to train and work and fight underneath Ricky Hatton and had a lot of success and he's a friend of yours, but yet you were going into battle kind of against the same team? Um, well, to be honest, it's very simple. I was working my whole life to get something and he was just simply standing in the way and that was that like when you have this such a strong mindset of what you want and you will be beyond relentless to get it you nothing matters so that to me just didn't matter at all okay um i've i've asked charlie beat about yourself um quite a lot and uh, also about the other fighters about when you become a uh, an icon in a sport or boxing or any kind of sport, you know how is how is like fame and social following? How does that kind of influence lifestyle or influence kind of the people that follow you? And he said like when Mick goes to New York, it's almost like a home for home because like so many people know him. He said, but when Ryan used to go, you know, back to Ireland, he said like it was just it was just like a household name a big celebrity i mean how have you found that kind of pressure because having a big social following and also being you know famous I, i've never achieved that so i'm just wondering like what is what's that like going back home and everybody knowing who you are and, and, and kind of becoming a big fan of yours it's it's nice like there's there's no other way of putting it it's really nice it's nice when the, someone comes up to me and asks you for a photo and it's nice when you go places and people give you everything for free it's nice it's lovely but I always my whole career even the now I remember where I was I remember what it's like to sleep in a cold car and not have anything 
and that just never left me. It just always was in me. So when life was great and people would shout your name from the rooftops, it never made me change because I remembered who I was and where I was and what I had at the time. So I always just used to take it as I go. And I was always the same guy. I never changed my whole career. I never changed. And even though you're coming famous and you're getting money and sort of do things that you never thought you could do, I just always was the same guy because at the end of the day, I just, I always knew what I had and what I used to be. And yeah. I would never, it would, it would, it was that ingrained into me that I would have never changed. I couldn't change even if I yeah. wanted to. I know you mentioned earlier about you know winning world titles and of course any any pro boxer I would imagine you know the the standard response is what they want to achieve from the sport is become world champion unify the division maybe go up a few weights or go down a few weights and and do it there hopefully become unbeaten or as close as you can can be to unbeaten um but then sometimes the conversation at that point stops um some boxers I've 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 spoken to them and they they talk about other stuff with you, Ryan, was there, beyond the world titles, was there anything else like, I want to become this rich? I want to become not necessarily famous, but I want to have this amount of following, or I want to do this. Was there, was there any other goals beyond the world titles? Yeah, my goal was to be mortgage-free on a house that no one could ever take away from me. My, my goal was to have a home mortgage-free. It's just, it's mine. And I, I was able to get to that. It wasn't, it wasn't any, my, personally for me was to have a family. It's, that's what it was, have a family and be able to provide. And that's what it was, yeah. Good stuff. Because, you know, look, I, I know it would sound a bit cringy if someone said, yeah, I want to become sort of famous. But if you had a big following, which you, which you have and you verified on Instagram and you are, let, let's have it right, in the boxing community and probably in the sports community and, and probably outside of that, you are recognised and famous. You've achieved some great stuff. If it's used in the right way, you can convert that, those followers, into, into clients of yours. So obviously now you've got Ryan Burnett Fitness, which is, um, talk to me a bit more about that and how has your kind of following helped that business? Well, to be when I retired from boxing, the plan there wasn't a plan. I, I wasn't like right. I'm going to become a trainer and open up my own gym. At that, I was sort of sitting thinking to myself, I am um, fucked. <laughs> I don't know what to do here, and I sort of reverted back to well, what do you have? What skill set do you have? What do you have that other people don't have? And what can you teach people? Well, you know boxing pretty well. You know what it's like to train. You know how to help people. One of my passions is to help people anyone that knows me will know that I'll always help people it's what I've just always loved to do so I thought well I'll open a gym and I'll just see where that goes and I opened the gym a couple of years ago and since it's been opened it's been it's been full I've been very busy with it you got ambitions to expand that uh, outside of like the premises you've got now or maybe do it more nationally, more internationally, anything like that? Um, well, yeah, the, see, I have a small gym. It's a one-to-one private gym, and I just train my clients one-to-one. And it's great, but the, the person that I am always wants bigger and better. Like I, I don't settle. I always keep pushing. And it was the same in my boxing career. I'd always keep pushing, pushing. So I do have plans to open up a, an even bigger gym and probably like that luxury commercial gym or something like that. Um, I've already got plans going on in my head that, well, that's where I want to be and that's what I want to do, I think. Becoming settled and just hitting the level and just saying, yeah, this will do. This is quite comfortable. I'll, I'll stay here for a while. That's never been my attitude. So once my little gym it became real comfortable, I thought, well, if I stay here, I'll end up in trouble. So I need to get even bigger. So yeah, pushing the boards up. Well, you could easily franchise your gym at a certain point. And again, I've seen some like, you know, Floyd Mayweather's done it, done it over in America. <coughs> again, this supports what I was saying earlier, that if you become a household name and become a profile, and certainly someone that 
people recognise and adore and admire and respect, which you are again, Ryan, you could easily franchise your own name or build it up and sell it off to a competitor later on down the line. Yeah. Um, and, and you know, setting goals, Ryan, do you ever just sit there at the start of the year? I mean, we're in 2022 now, and I know you might have some thoughts, but I'm in business for myself, and I'm always telling my sales team, if you want to achieve massive heights this year, you need to write down your goals, read your goals, and do that every fucking day in, 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 in order to, to get to where you want to be. Is that something you do, write down goals and, and, and say them back to yourself? Yeah, every year. I mean, I think you're touching on the likes of the law of attraction and stuff like that. Would that be right? Yeah. I, I do that. I've done that my whole career and I still do it now. Every year I write down my goals at the beginning of the year of what I'm going to achieve by the end of the year. And I, I always reach them. Every, every year I always reach them. I think it's good, important to be reach big and then work for it. Yeah, because in your boxing career, in your business career, and no doubt you're going to go through it as a family man now, you know, a, a dad. Um, you know, when you're, when you're faced with challenges, how, how has your goals kind of got you to persevere and got you through those tough times? Um, I just, I'm very relentless. Like, if I'm going for something, like, there is, there is nothing really can stop me. And I think... I always personally just say to myself, if you remain relentless, then you'll you'll achieve it. And that's what I've always done. I've, I'm I'm known as relentless Ryan Burnett. That's what, that's what people call me now because so, I'm so. So define what that means, though, because relentless is subjective, isn't it? It could be relentless in your mindset. It could be relentless in your work ethic. It could be relentless with me pissing you off to try and get you on this podcast. I'm only joking. Um, but, you know, what, what, what does relentless mean to you? Relentless means to me, keep going when everyone else will stop. You just keep going. Do more than what everyone else will, is willing to do. Because if you're always that guy, then you can't be the same as everyone else. And that's something that you're in control of. So there's so much stuff in the world that you're not in control of. There's only a very few things that you are in control of. And for me... It's being relentless. No one can take that away from me because it's me. So when I approach something that I'm really passionate and want, I'll be relentless to do it. I will move. I will, I'll get up earlier to do something. I'll stay later. I'll do that little bit more than the average person would do. And if I continue being that guy, how can I possibly be the same as everyone else? Because I'm yeah. the type of person that wants more. Yeah, yeah, understood. Um, you said something earlier about you know you 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 know inspiring in in your in your professional fights where you might be bo- boxing, and I would say you know as a fan again your your attributes is you're a very very good boxer, but then you were told to start having a fight, and I think there is a bit of a difference between a good boxer and a good fighter. I mean, if we think about a good fighter, the first person that comes into my mind is. Uh, Tyson, you know, absolute beast, absolute relentless, just to coin your phrase, and someone that's a true fighter. But then you get someone like a, a, a good boxer, someone like a Mayweather. Um, obviously, they do flicker in between a bit, you know, good fighters, good boxers. But do you think becoming a good fighter, you know, that 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 beast inside of someone, that 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 kind of bottled up anger, you know, someone what wants it, do you think that's something that can be taught or you're born with it? Um... I think you have you have to be born with it. It just has to be ingrained in you. It's like, I don't think it can be taught, no. You just have to have this real deep desire for when you're in the well, when you're getting it tough, you're able to keep going at someone's soul at the end of the day. Like, that's what keeps you going. And no, I don't think it can be taught. I think you either have it or you don't. Okay, that's a good answer. Um yeah, because, uh, you know, be, being younger, when I used to go to like, I know, uh, to the pubs and clubs when I was a younger man, and no doubt every so often a fight would kick off, even if the, 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 some of the friendship group that I had at the time, some of them weren't technically really good. There was always those individuals in that group of people that were quite game for a fight. And it doesn't matter whether there was glasses being thrown around or there was 
people that were outnumbered, you could always rely on certain individuals to be quite game. And I was just going to, I've always wondered that when I've asked professional fighters or boxers, can you actually learn to be a, a fighter, someone that's got that bottled ingre- aggression you know, inside of you, or is something you're just simply born with? And um, yeah, it was nice to get your, your, your response to that, Ryan. Your, your attributes then, um, becoming a great boxer or fighter, I mean, what would you say is your number one or number you know, top three attributes? Speed, you know, your, your, your engine, your power, what would you say? Um, I think I, was, I would always think, I was just able to, in the heat of the moment, I was always able to slow things down in my own mind and be composed in a high intense situation. That's something that, that a lot of people can't do. For example, when I've never been, I had never been cut before. And when in my first world title fight, I got a cut on the head, which was to the bone, really bad. And the blood was flowing. But if you see during that fight or during those moments of me getting badly cut, I don't panic. I don't, nothing happens. I just completely remain the same fighter. And I think number one would be staying composed in a high intense situation. Uh, number two was my heart. Like I was able to stick with it when the fire was turned up. I was always able to stick with it. Like when the Zaki Anoff fight happened, um, I was just able to stay, stay there when he was the type of person who relied on breaking someone. And that's what he was known for. He was a bully. And he was able to break people with his heavy hands. And I was just able to, no matter what, no matter what, I would always have been, I'm game. And number three, yeah, I know, I think it was pretty fast with my head movement. They're getting out of danger. So I relied on that quite a bit. Yeah. Um, going back to not so much fame, but look, I'm 36 years of age. And I think doing my research at 29. 29. Mate, you, uh, what I would do to be twenty nine again, mate? I know it's not even it's not even that f- a lo- long long ago, really. But honestly, what you've achieved so far, you know, in, in your twenties, I mean, my God, over the next 10, 20 years, if you keep on applying yourself with that same mindset and relentlessness, mate, you could go to massive, massive heights, no doubt. Um, but I'm what I was going to get to is I'm thirty six, right? When I was at school, there was no such thing as social media. There was no such thing as YouTube. There was definitely no such thing as, as podcasts. And had there been podcasts, it might have given me a bit of inspiration and direction to go down a certain path in life. So, so number one, I want to ask you, have you ever in your career listened to like, you mentioned Law of Attraction, okay, which is the secret. So things like that or people outside of that, Tony Robbins, personal development, listening to great interviews that, you know, not necessarily all of them have to be athletes or boxers, but people that just motivated you. Who have you gravitated towards? What sort of content? Um, well, when I was living in England, I had no friends over there. I had no family over there. I was really on my own. Now, at the end of my career, I lived with Adam and his family. But you're still on your own, in a sense, because you're in a training camp. You, you sort of, you're on your own. So every night, I would before I would go to bed, I'd go for a walk for an hour and I would listen to podcast stuff and I would listen to mindset and I listen to all these things and the likes of Tony Robinson and uh, David Goggins um, and just a general a lot of stuff on YouTube how to develop your own brain I did a real ton of listening and searching on stuff like that um, and I think that definitely developed me into the person and the fighter that, that I was well, it, the old saying is, you are what you eat. If you eat uh, junk food, you're going to turn into maybe some obese or certainly some very, very unhealthy person, which you're not going to have a great life. But also, you are what you consume, and that means in your mind. And whatever you're listening to or watching, you're eventually going to have start having that mindset, which is definitely going to be affecting you. And um, this this goes on next to like your peer group and also your team. How important is it to have winners around you people that uplift you radiate your success i mean obviously the given is adam and your teammates they're expected to be those people but even your own close family members or, or close friends i mean how important is it to have the right people around you ryan it's it is people can drain your energy 
So you have people that will drain you, drain your energy or give you energy. And with, with me, I had no one around me. I just chose to have no one around me. Uh, the only person I real had around me was my wife. Um, and like what this is when I was in training camp and having her by my side and help me was great. And apart from that, I didn't, like I didn't give anyone the opportunity to, to drain my energy or take anything away from me. And there was definitely people that did and they were quickly discarded. Removed. Yeah. yeah. But you know, that, I mean, um, it, it almost feels like that came kind of second nature to you, but there's so many people out there and I could even name a few, which I won't cause it'd be disrespectful in my circle of people that I know that they're just clearly around the wrong people and it's sapping them of their energy and their ambitions. I mean, what's, what's a bit of advice from a, from a champion? How, how can you go about doing it? How can you almost appear to be a bit ruthless, but in order to become the better version of yourself? Well, for me, it was real simple. It was, well, what do you want? I want to be a world champion and I want to provide for my family that person is stopping you from doing it, then fuck off. And that really was my attitude in my whole career. Like I was for forever. It really was. You're not serving me here. Yeah. See, see, see you later. Yeah. And that's why I was a bit of a loner. Like I didn't, didn't socialize with much people. I, I didn't, I didn't even write in the WhatsApp groups because I was just who I was probably just instinctively that's who I was it wasn't real oh well I have to do this I think it boils down a little bit that instinctively who you are and for me it was I performed better when there was no one around me and the people that was around me was uh, three people I think Adam um, my wife and my brother from nine, nine again that was it really do you know um so in the era of Muhammad Ali, George Foreman, and then we got the Mike Tysons, and then you know Lennox Lewis, Holyfield, etc. To- totally kind of different era, uh, and the cert- you know the 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 landscape of boxing was different. Still very exciting, but just a bit different. They kind of you know recovered, trained, a and you know kept on repeating that cycle, and they left other parts to their boxing, like the promotion, everything else down to the promoters and stuff. But now I feel it's quite different because of social media. And you you kind of almost, not forced, but kind of encouraged to go out there and promote yourself on the social medias. But we know that comes with a bit of downside. And the downside to that is if you kind of say one thing wrong or perceived something wrong, the mainstream media can jump onto it and turn it into something that it's not. And then you can start getting hate abuse X, Y, Z, and it becomes a bit of a distraction. How did you use like the things like Instagram as, as a bit of a tool back in the day? Or is it something, again, you were just like, no, nope, this is not going to help me, so I'm not going to do anything on it whatsoever? I was exactly like that. Yes, I would post pictures or videos and, and me training, maybe, stuff like that. But you can never... I know that no one can ever find a video of me talking bad about someone or being disrespectful or anything like that because that just wasn't me um so i didn't really use i was just i, I don't know people i know people fighters have to use it to big themselves up to create a bit of hype about themselves to get somewhere else but i was just very fortunate that my sort of boxing did it for me so i didn't have to be that guy so when i know i used to get people saying things to me other fighters and stuff but i was like well, by me tweeting back to you, it's gonna do nothing for me. So, like, go ahead, say whatever you want. Yeah. And they did. Uh, you you can't ever see me uh, giving it back to other fighters or anything like that. It just wasn't me. Yeah, you know, because you you come across like really really calm and very very cool, and like it almost seems like nothing phases you. Um, but then if you look at someone like. Conor McGregor, for example, I mean, his resume recently hasn't been so great, but yet he's such a big outlandish, outspoken individual. He's got a 
bundles of confidence. I mean, you know, if he says something, you really buy into it because he says it with conviction and he obviously talks about law of attraction, etc. But like I said, his, his resume very recently hasn't been that great, but still he sells out arenas and he gets the most amount of money. And this is what I'm saying, like younger fighters now, it's almost like they're looking at someone like a Conor McGregor or how Floyd maybe used to be. And it's almost encouraging them sometimes to be a different person who they really are and sometimes even become disrespectful just to sell a fight. I mean, how, how do you, you know, I'm not asking you to name any names, but can you see that kind of culture being sort of cultivated now, Ryan? Well, it works. Like, if you want to be that guy, it works. I could have did it and probably would have been a little bit better off or a little bit better known or something if I did that. But that just wasn't me. Like, I just didn't want to be that guy. And I bet you if, well, I'd say chances are if you sat down with Conor McGregor, and you knew him. He probably isn't like that. It's, I'd say it's probably put on a little bit. Uh, because it works, it sells, it draws people in. No one really wants to follow the boring guy, which which I kind of was. Um, and I that I don't I don't mind that. That's okay. That suits me because I knew that if I just fight and if I win, I'm going to get what I want. I don't need to be this. No, I know that works, but it wasn't for me. So I just didn't really. Want to be into it. It, it's funny you say that, right? Because when you, when you just said that point, uh, do you need to get that? No, no, my wife no, will. No. All right. Um, when you said that point, you instantaneously reminded me of a former guest that I had, a guy called O'Hara Davis, who 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 you probably know. Um, and I saw him once on um, YouTube, and I think he had the most amount of hits on this particular YouTube video where he kind of confronted Floyd Mayweather. I don't know if you ever saw that particular video go around once. So Floyd Mayweather was doing a tour, you know, around the world and you could go and meet him. And I think O'Hara, he said to me, he said, I was going to meet him as more of a fan. And as he got closer to him, he said, right, how can I turn this environment into an opportunity where I could become a bit more well-known? And he basically, he basically just kind of not squared up to him, but, you know, was basically giving him some verbal jabs and seeing that video to how O'Hara was live on the podcast, two different people. And he actually did say on the podcast, and he, you could listen to it back, he said, no, I put it on in order to get to get more hits. Um, some people have got that characteristic to do it, and other people simply haven't. I'm not saying what, one is right or wrong, but the facts are what I'm trying to get to. People not are not always what they perceive to be over social media, uh, Ryan, you know? I definitely I agree. And a lot of it is a lot of it is put on. For example, the guy, the YouTuber Jake Paul. Everyone dislikes him. No one likes him. He's a bit of a cock. But if you look at his friendship group, he has like real famous people who is his friends. So there's no way you can be such a dick but have such a friendship group. And that just goes to show that these high-end people wouldn't be around him if he was such a bad person. So it goes to show that this is just all put on. I bet you the guy, Jake Paul, behind closed doors is probably a real good guy. But it's obviously it's put on. It sells. It yeah. works. Um, just on that note, I was never going to ask you this in, in, in this in this interview, but I asked Trish Dixon and he gave me quite a blunt view towards it. And I want to ask a former world champion, right? And also, you know what? It just occurred to me. I think you're the only first, well, actual world champion I've had on my podcast. So thank you very much for that. Um, <laughs> the um, YouTubers now converting into boxers. What, what's, what's your take of that? Do you think it's good for the sport or do you think it is actually no. not disrespectful or maybe disrespectful for the sport? It's shocking for the sport. I mean, these YouTubers, they shouldn't be able to get a license. They shouldn't be allowed to box. Um, they're not boxers you can see their skill set they are not fighters uh yes they're fighting each other and they're making a few quid can't knock that go ahead well well done but like people work their whole lives to become boxers and they train their whole lives and then you have these youtubers coming in throwing handbags about and thinking they are something um i just i, I personally i don't agree with it i just think it's stupid 
because like um, he he re- uh, apparently made forty five million dollars last year uh, through the three fights that he had, which I think was two with Woodley and um, the other uh, Ben Askrim, I think it was at the start of the year, and yeah. the opponents, even though they were fighters, they weren't boxing fighters, and. I mean, he's only had four fights and then you've got someone like yourself who's double champ and, you know, been around the block and had a big pedigree, you know, amateur career, etc. You can see why people say it's kind of disrespectful. Uh, it, I, it is disrespectful a little bit to the sport, but for the guy, fair play to him. I mean, yeah. if you had a chance to be something that you're not and get 45 million pound out of it any of any any fighter in the world would do it and so as a for the sport of boxing i don't think he should be ever allowed to box because he's not a fighter but as a person you can only sort of give him a round of applause because the whole world knows who he is and he's making a load of money for it so well, he's put himself in that position. I mean, there's, there's even talks that he's going to fight someone like a Conor McGregor and no doubt he'll probably come out of that fight, win, lose or draw, but I seriously think he's going to get the, his head kicked in. Um, <laughs> he's probably going to come out of that with probably 100 million or something. Yeah, well, there you go. I mean, how can you knock that? Like, you, you can't... <laughs> someone like yourself, Ryan, I uh, just want to round us off this uh, podcast of conversation because I know you've got your family there and stuff and I appreciate your time. Who's in, inspired you? Doesn't have to be boxers, but on that note, is there any boxers that you've ever looked up to or drawn a bit of inspiration from? And then any figures outside of boxing? Um, someone who I used to look up to when I was young was Carl Frampton. Um, I was in the same boxing club as him, and he was always a few years older than me doing the kind of stuff that I wanted to do. So having him knocking about the gym and me looking at him thinking to myself, well, if he can do it, I can definitely do it. And for a long time, I was always looking up the car, being like, well, if he can do it, I can do it. And that sort of always, the proof was always right in front of me because he was doing it. And that sort of always gave me a bit of motivation. Yeah. Anyone outside of boxing? Any other figures? Uh, no, not really. It was, I think, me. I just I always focused on me I don't really focus on anyone else focused on me and what I can get there wasn't anyone outside of boxing that that I focused on it was just it was always me I was just focused on me yeah okay cool so look um, if people were to come and find you Ryan if they're in your neck of the woods uh, want to you know see what you're up to obviously follow your your business etc where can they where can they do all that I do everything on Instagram Okay. So they, so everything, all my contacts and everything and how I would interact with people would be on my Instagram. I'd be it. I'm not massive on social media and contacting people and things like that. I sort of just let it deal with itself. But the only way I really contact me would be on Instagram. Okay. Are you ever traveling back into the UK or is it just staying uh, yeah, in, well, in Ireland? I was, I was actually talking to Adam the other day and we have promised because of COVID and everything, I hadn't been over in a while. So we've said that we're. I'm definitely making a trip to England this year. So, yes, I will be in the UK this year. Yeah, lovely stuff. And are you ever going to do like commentary or get involved with you know outside of your business in boxing again in any way, shape, or form? Um, I don't know. I've I've been asked to do a bit of commentary, and I've asked. I've been asked by a load of fighters to become their coach, but it's just something that, at the moment, anyway, I'm not too interested in. I'm sort of I'm. A, I'm uh, I'm happy on the path that I'm on at the moment to grow myself and grow my business and now focusing more on my family and so sort of I'm happy where I'm at so I don't nothing else is coming into it I've just I'm on a bit of a path myself. All right, fair enough, Ryan. This is last question, okay? Um, so when I started my my business, uh, the first business when I was 24 years of age, it was predominantly a sales company. I had about 50 people working on that sales floor at one time, and most of them were men. There was probably about three or four women at the time. It was predominantly testosterone, alpha male type environment. 
you know, pretty crazy at times. And to becoming the best version of a salesperson, you need to have the right mindset because most of the time when you're selling, you get loads of no's. It's like 90, 90%, uh, 99% no's and only a few, you know, you know, one percent or, or sometimes yeah. a little bit more, which is yeses. So I come up with a mantra, which is this: be happy, never content. So if I were to ask Ryan Burnett, what does "be happy, never content" mean to you? Um, what would that what would that phrase mean to me? Yeah, I mean, I mean, you're pretty bang on the money. It's like be happy, but always keep driving for something. I think one of the most dangerous things you can do is hit a spot and say, well, I'll just stay here for a while because this is nice and cosy. Because staying cosy, you end up losing everything. So you need to be, it's sort of the same term as mine, mine is to be relentless. And yeah, I understand exactly what you mean. Be happy, but I mean, you got to keep going no matter what. So yeah, I like it. Good, good man. Okay, thank you very much for your time. If everyone's enjoyed the, the podcast, Definitely please give Ryan a uh, follow, which you probably do anyway. Um, and always remember to be happy, never content. Thank you very much, Ryan. God bless, mate.